Mad Catholic is created by ordinary people with deep faith and lots of questions so we all can unbox our faith. Now, here's your host, Kelly Worth. And today's special guest, the Reverend Dr. Shannon Sterringer. You may have noticed by now here at Mad Catholic that we have a special love for women who work hard to renew the Catholic Church. What you may not know is the cost many women pay when they question church leadership or simply answer God's call to serve. Today's show is about two such women. The first was born in the 12th century in Germany, and she used her many gifts to serve God. She was a talented artist, writer, composer, philosopher, mystic, visionary, and practitioner of herbal medicine. She built and led women's faith communities. She corresponded with world leaders and ordinary people in the course of offering them spiritual guidance, and she had no fear of speaking truth to power. She sometimes got into trouble for messing with the patriarchy, but remained faithful to God's directives. The second woman we will meet today she was born in the 20th century, in her growth and movement to serve her church as an ordained woman priest, she has utilized her writing skill, scholarly intellect, love of worship and sacraments, and her devotion to social justice to make a change in the world. Our guest, too, has made, as Congressman John Lewis might say, some good trouble with the powers that be, and she's paid dearly for it. Yet, in her ongoing work to celebrate Catholicism in a new way, she clings to her faith and the Spirit's guidance to see her through. Reverend Dr. Shannon Sterringer is a theologian and an ordained priest with Roman Catholic women priests with over two decades of pastoral experience, and she's a strong advocate for holistic health and spirituality. Her background includes a Ph.D. 2016 from Union Institute and University in Ethical and Creative Leadership, focused on the example of St. Hildegard of Bingen a D-Min in 2012, and an M.A. in Theology in 2007 from St. Mary's Seminary and Graduate School of Theology, an M.A. in Ministry in 2011 from Ursuline College, and a B.A. in 2003 from Cleveland State University. She is a certified minister with training in pastoral care and counseling and sacramental preparation, including marriage and funerals. She has received a number of awards and acknowledgments over the years for her academic and pastoral achievements. She is the author of a daily meditation book, 30-Day Journey with St. Hildegard of Bingen, from Fortress Press in 2019, and a memoir, Forbidden Grace, published in 2021. Reverend Shannon is also the owner of The Green Shepherdess, a fair trade boutique, in Fairport Harbor, Ohio and now serves as a member of the Fair Trade Federation Board of Directors. She is married and is the mother of three beautiful adult daughters. In her spare time, she is an amateur beekeeper, and she loves to be outside, walking, collecting Lake Erie beach glass, and reading. Her greatest passion, though, is St. Hildegard of Bingen, and her second spiritual home is on the Rhine River in Germany. She has dedicated her life to discovering creative, ways to help others renew their greenness, their veriditas of mind, body, and spirit. I'm delighted to have Reverend Shannon with us today. I've met this amazing Catholic woman. I've been in her garden and walked in her lovely world of Hildegard House. I've also worshipped with her vital faith community. She's been supportive of my ordination journey, and I read her book with delight, relating on many levels. I know she will continue to be a positive spiritual force in my own journey as a Catholic woman. Welcome, Reverend Shannon. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I, I did read your book, and it struck me on so many levels. I think we'll focus mainly on that today. The title, Forbidden Grace. There's a lot packed into that for you, isn't there? 
<laughs> you've had some challenges as Absolutely. you grew in ministry. So would you like to give us just a little bit of your background, how you grew in a call to ministry and how you found grace forbidden to you? Absolutely. So I, um, I'm a cradle Catholic. I grew up in a, an Italian Catholic environment, uh, was raised in Catholic schools. Uh, of course, as a young adult, as many of us do, I um, wrestled a bit with the church, especially its uh, position on uh, women, women's ordination and uh, the way the church treats uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community. And and so there were, um, and, and those who, you know, have uh, been married and, and divorced and um, just, or uh, remarried, I'm sorry. And just, I struggled with a lot of that. And so in my young adult years, I went on a sort of a, an explorative journey, looking at different uh, faith traditions. I bounced around a bit with uh, within some of the Protestant denominations and and then moved outside of that and explored some of the uh, Eastern traditions, such as Buddhism and um and, and, uh, and others. And I, uh, while, while I was an undergrad at Cleveland State University, uh, working on a degree in um, uh, uh, medieval uh, religious history, uh, which my uh, bachelor's is, is in, uh, in church history, er, religious uh, history, Christian history, uh, I had a wonderful professor, a Buddhist professor, who I had sat down to talk with about some of it. And uh, he's, you know, he said, you know, um, for, for myself, he said, you're, you're moving horizontally along this faith journey. You're, you know, you're bouncing from place to place looking, you know, for whatever it is that you're looking for. You, you need to go vertically. You need to go down. Pick one, whatever it is, you know, whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, uh, et cetera, pick one and go deeper. And so that kind of pushed me back to my Catholic space because that's what I knew. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to go deeper, I'm going to start with what I know. So I, I made my way as a young adult, young 20s, back to the um, back to the, the Roman Catholic Church. And, um, you know, long story short, I, I became involved. I, I My husband and I were newly married and we were living in uh, Fairport Harbor at the time. And um, I became involved in the local uh, Catholic uh, parish, St. Anthony of Padua. And I fell in love with the community and my heart was set on fire just to dig deeper as this professor suggested I do. And, and so I um, started to get very involved in the parish. I was first hired as an office administrator. And then I went, you know, after I finished my bachelor's degree, I um, decided to uh, go into the um, master's program at the diocesan seminary, which uh, they, they offer a master's in theology to, um, to lay, to lay students, which are largely women. Um, and so, you know, to study right alongside of the seminarians. And, and so for the next 10 years or so, um, my heart was just on fire to, um, you know, to learn everything I could and to, to uh, take as many classes at the seminary as I could. And, you know, I, as I was um, moving through those programs, formation programs, as well as uh, academic programs, uh, and, you know, taking on uh, this, uh, certain training programs, you know, in, in terms of working with couples preparing for marriage or those who need annulments or sacramental prep, all that stuff. Um, I, you know, my, my heart was just, um, just, I was just on fire. I just, I couldn't get enough of it. And so as I was moving along, I uh, ended up, uh, again, this is a long story short, it's in, it's outlined more in more detail in the book, but I ended up in the Diocese of Cleveland has a, uh, a lay ecclesial minister program. And so essentially what that is, is a three-year formation program uh, at the seminary um, that I, I uh, worked on simultaneously with my academic degrees there while also working full-time in the parish that um, prepares uh, lay people, and again, primarily it's women in that program, um, to function in a parish as a pastoral associate. Um, you know, under that umbrella, there's a lot of different roles we could um, fill. But uh, the, the main uh, purpose as, as well at that time, I'm not so sure that that's their purpose now, but at that time it was um, as there was, you know, becoming more obvious that there was a declining number of, of men responding to the priesthood, you know, there was a need to have parish administrators who could, could run the parish in the absence of a priest and, you know, and then just have priests come in for sacramental celebration. So I went through all of those trainings. Um, and and uh, completed a number of uh, de the degrees in, along the way. So I completed the, the master's degree at the seminary in theology. And then I wanted to go into the doctoral program at the seminary, but to do so, I had to have an MDiv. And um, the seminary uh, does not grant MDivs to, to women. Uh, you know, it's reserved only for the uh, seminarians. However, they have a program they call an MDiv equivalent. So basically that means you take all the classes, do all the work, so that you can get into the doctoral program, uh, however you you know you can earn the degree. And so I I 
completed the MDiv equivalent. And in the process of that, I realized, um, you know, out in the real world, uh, nobody cares about the equivalent. They want to see a completed degree. So I took all those uh, credits over to the local uh, Catholic uh, Women's College in Cleveland, Ursuline College, and they were gracious enough to transfer them in and make it possible for me to, with a bit more uh, coursework, to complete a second master's degree in ministry. So that's why I have two master's degrees. Um, the second master's degree is really my MDiv. Um, but anyways, I went into the doctoral program. And at that time, I, I was really wrestling with a call to ordain ministry. You know, I, I had realized, you know, the lay ecclesial ministry program, which I had applied for, I went through, I was certified, and I served as a pastoral associate for many years, um, really wasn't where I was being called. And, and but it was really the only door open to me. And uh, where I really felt called was to be with the seminarians and to follow the ordination track. And so I took a break um, for about six months from the seminary programs, from the, the doctoral program, as well as the pastoral ministry program. Well, this was in 2010, while I explored um, the Episcopal Church. You know, I, I think almost every Roman Catholic woman priest at some point along our journey has dabbled <laughs> with the Episcopal Church because it's, it's such a, a close um, yeah. fit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I spent six months. Um, I, I, I did not I did not leave my position in the parish and I kind of kept it a bit quiet. I was very honest and transparent with the seminary and the uh, formation program, but I, I didn't bring it to the parish level. I kept it kind of quiet. Um, but what I realized in, in that experience um, is I fell in love with the Episcopal Church. I loved everything about my, my six months with with them, with them and, um, and the formation. And it was tempting on so many levels. Uh, but one of the um, comments made by the uh, advisor I was working with um, in the Episcopal Church, you know, she said, and I'm paraphrasing her a little bit here, but she basically said, you know, Shannon, uh, you definitely have a vocation and a call. She's looking at my transcripts, our conversations. She said, you know, you definitely have a call. She said, but what, what you need to decide is, are you being called to be Episcopalian or are you being called to be Catholic in a new way? And that just changed everything for me. I, I left that, that meeting. I took it to prayer. And I all of a sudden realized as much as I love loved the Episcopal Church, I felt like I, I would be using it to be ordained because in my heart, I'm a Catholic. I've been, that's all I know. I've been a Catholic my whole life and very entrenched in Catholicism. And so I decided to be Catholic in a new way and uh, resigned myself to the fact that I'll never be ordained because, you know, out, outside of going the route that I ended up going, it just wasn't op an option. So, but in that, and I mentioned all this because in that 2009, 2010 discernment period with the Episcopal Church, I met Hildegard of Bingen and just fell in love with Hildegard. And so I knew at that time she was going to be uh, the focus of, of my work, my life's work. And so... Uh, and I felt okay with it. It wasn't really where I was called. You know, I thought I'm not going to be able to be ordained, but maybe I can continue to plant seeds where I can and, and just be Catholic in a new way, um, bring Hildegard to the world and, um, and continue to work in the diocese as I had been. And so, um, I, I, you know, I, I love the uh, expression, well, it, I'm going to make it inclusive, you know, a uh, humans propose and God disposes, you know, I had this plan, this is what I'm going to do now. And God's like, eh, Maybe. <laughs> I'll let you do it for a while, but I, I've got something else in mind for you. So so I graduated from the seminary with a doctorate with honors. Um, I passed my colloquium with honors, my defense with honors. Um, and I wrote for my doctoral uh, paper at the seminary on the role of women in leadership in the history of the Catholic Church. You know, I had started my, as I said, my bachelor's degree was in um, in uh, Christian history. So I, I, I'm a a, you know, a bit of a historian as well. So I did a, a historical survey of the way women have functioned in leadership roles in the church historically. I stayed away from the ordination topic because, you know, not, I wanted I wanted to graduate, didn't touch that. But I, you know, talked about just the very significant ways women have functioned from, you know, the early church, Mary Magdalene and the early di disciples, uh, female disciples, and even through the, the contemporary times, because at that time in the Diocese of Cleveland, we had a, a female chancellor, we had a female worship director and we had a female academic dean at the seminary. So, I mean, those are significant roles that um, canon law allows to be filled by women, but many bishops don't. And so um, even though we didn't have a very progressive bishop, he um, at the time, he did say, you know, they were the best applicants for the jobs. And because canon law allowed for it, you know, we had so we had women in some very significant roles. So I wanted I wanted to, to sing their phrases a little bit. So anyways, I graduated um, from the seminary. But in the course of those studies, I had um, met Hildegard. 
and I really couldn't give her any more space in this paper than all these other women I was studying. But as soon as I finished that degree, I, um, on the uh, suggestion of the uh, rector at the time at the seminary, I decided to uh, to pursue a PhD just in Hildegard studies. And so I, I focused on uh, Hildegard as a, a model of leadership. And, and again, still expecting to be um, you know, uh, working until I retired for the diocese. So my, my PhD dissertation was very much written with that in mind. If I were to rewrite it today, it would probably take a little different direction. But at that time, I really was hoping to produce something that would be beneficial to my, my ministry in the diocese. So, so that, you know, in a nutshell, and I know you're probably gonna have more questions about the Hildegard house and how that all came to be, but that's how I met Hildegard. That's how I ended up on the, the track that I did. And all the way up until 2018, um, even though 2009, 2010, I had taken a, a little bit of a, a break to uh, explore ordination, um, up until 2018, I had resigned myself to the fact that it's just not in the cards for me. And so um, it, it was, um, it was, a, there was a, there's an internal struggle that goes with that, as you know, um, because uh, when we're not fully living out who God's created us to be, you know, you get depressed, you get all kinds of things because you're just not able to live with integrity and authenticity. So that's how I ended up, you know, um, on this track and also why I chose to um, stay in, in the Catholic world, even though it came with it came, you know, excommunications and other things that I would prefer to have not dealt with um, just because I was trying to be true to who I am. And I'm a cat. I'm a Catholic, <laughs> regardless of what the diocesan bishop says. I'm a Catholic. And so, yeah. So, so that's how I, I got to Hildegard, and that's how I got. You know, again, I it's just the backstory. I wanted to let you no, know, share that piece. That's great. I as I read your book, I was struck with the the sort of stair step process that you went through. You know, you would complete a degree or you would work in the parish in a particular way. And you're like, this is good. This is great. I, this is enough. I this is, this will do. I would rather have more, but I can do this. And then the discontent would set in and it would be like, ah, oh, no, this isn't it. You know, that, that frustration that kept driving you forward. And uh, I was very struck by that. I could very much relate. Right. Uh, and you do, it, it's a very deep thing. I don't think people realize what a call does to you in terms of making everything else and you try everything mm -hmm. else you do because you want to be obedient and you want to be a good Catholic. So you try everything mm -hmm. else and then you're just sitting there with this. Well, I did really well at that, but that's not the thing. So I, I could really relate to that. Exactly. And it's and what we give up. I don't think people realize that. I mean, I really had a a, a very um, blossom. My, my career was blossoming. I was respected in the diocese. I worked really hard to get to the places I was at. And, you know, it, with that comes, I have to let all of this go. And I mean, I don't know that people always understand I know a lot of times women priests are criticized for being ambitious or whatever, you know, the crit critics say, uh, not realizing that really the opposite is true. You know, if ambition was the goal, I would have stayed where I was at because I was I was climbing the ladder in many ways. And so, you know, I even had somebody um, say to me at, at the time when I announced that I was resigning. Um, you know, because all of my training, all of my uh, degrees, everything is in Roman Catholicism. And again, that's what I, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's a part of me. It's, it's, I, you often hear people say it's in my, you're in, in our DNA. I mean, it's, it's in every cell of my body, uh, which is also why I really wasn't comfortable moving to a different denomination because it's like, this is who I am. And if God could call me over there, why can't God call me over here? And, um, and so that, that moment of knowing that, um, you know, if I don't take this step, I'm not being true to myself, but if I do, it's going to cause all of this that we've worked so hard to uh, earn, if you will, um, we have to let go of it. And this person made the comment to me, she said, well, you know, you're now unemployed and unemployable. <laughs> I said, well, this is a friend of mine. I said, well, that makes me feel much better, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it is that moment of, you know, I, I'm not going to go back to school and get another degree. You know, I have, five, I have five degree, you know, bachelor's, two master's and two doctorates. It's like, this is who I am. And how then do we take that and transform it to continue to be used in ministry when we are facing excommunication and um, being knocked out of all of the roles that we previously 
filled. So uh, it comes with a very high price that I'm not sure people always realize. And the only thing in my mind that really drives somebody to, to make those sacrifices is an authentic call. Because when you have an authentic call, you know, St. Augustine once said, our hearts are restless till they rest in God. And it, when you have that call, they're, you're restless until you get to a place where you can respond to it. Very good. I, I do have to say, in addition to that, you know, um, in addition to, the, as you mentioned about, you know, getting to a place and saying, all right, I'm good. I can do this. I, I said that many times along my journey. Um, the spirit has a way of saying, well, no, you're not. Because um, in 2016, and again, this is outlined more in detail in the book, in 2018, um, two things happened, one in the local diocese, one in another diocese I was involved with in India, that um, really, um, well, one of them broke my heart, but the other one, um, both of them pushed me, if you will, you know, out of my place of contentment. They created situations where I couldn't stay where I was at, even though I wanted to. And it, they weren't anything that I was directly involved in, but they were situations that, um, you know, I ended up a part of. And I think when that happens, when the spirit puts things along our path, um, it's it's uh, it's another way of God saying, you know, I'm not going to let you get too comfortable. You know, you still have you still have to keep moving and you still have another uh, another task ahead of you. So those two uh, life moments, especially the one in 2018 were also a part of, of my decision to to finally embrace my call to ordain ministry in the Roman Catholic context. One incident, and some people might say it was a minor incident, but I really cringed for you when, when you described in the book how when you as a lay minister in your parish put on an alb and a person walked in on you mm -hmm. and just you know, how dare you as a woman have this all on? I mean, it's, it's, it's a thousand little cuts for a woman who is trying to serve it, You know, there's always this, you're, yeah. you can't do that. You can't go that far. Now, who do you think you are? So I, I was moved by that story. Well, well, it is. And it, on one level, yes, it, it, someone might say it's minor, but the, you know, the whole scene, it was Good Friday for the reading of the Passion. And so, you know, the uh, missile breaks the Passion up into narrator voice and Jesus. And so I um, was blessed for 22 years to be in a parish with a wonderful pastor and a wonderful deacon. So I do have to say I had very fertile soil for my um, vocation to grow. Um, and so uh, oftentimes, you know, on, on Good Friday, they would invite a, a member of the community to uh, to be the voice. So the deacon was usually the narrator. The priest, of course, was Jesus. And then they would invite a member of the community to, to come up to the uh, third ambo and be, a, well, we, you know, the priest would be at the altar, the deacon would be at the ambo, and then uh, the, the voice at the lectern. And so they had asked me, you know, that year if I would um, would be willing to do that. And, you know, I said, of course. Um, and then when they asked me to put an alibi, now, no, you know, not a stole. So really, essentially, I was wearing the same thing that the altar servers were wearing. So I had no more garb on than, you know, than the fifth grade altar server next to me. But nonetheless, I'm an adult woman. Um, and it did not break any canonical rules or anything like that by having it on. But I, I was already, you know, it was the first probably was the first time I, I can't remember exactly, but close to the, it probably, no, I believe it was the first time I ever wore an alb. Now, after that, I, I think I wore one every weekend and, you know, I'm still wearing my same alb 15 years later, but it was the first time I'd had an alb on. So there's something very um, vulnerable about that because we're, we're in a, a different space. And, you know, there, you do have in the back of your mind, what are people going to say? Are they going to understand? What are they going to think? And I was in the foyer of the church with the, with the deacon and the priest. And, you know, we have for, had, had for Good Friday four cross bearers that carry the big heavy cross and, of course, all men. So I'm the only woman. In, and now they all had albs on as well, but I was the only woman in the foyer with an alb on. And this woman um, came in and actually pointed and laughed. And I think what came out of her mouth was, hell no. And it was like just a couple minutes before the, the liturgy started. And, you know, of course, I had two options to run out crying, which is what I felt like doing. But I thought, I, I can't, you know, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, you just you get up, you put your game face on. And as I got to the, uh, you know, got into the sanctuary, when I started to read my parts or in, you know, engage in the reading of the Passion, it was that moment of I could intimately connect to that reading, you know, with Jesus being mocked and jeered at because I had just experienced it myself in the foyer of the church. And so on one level, yes, it seems like a minor incident, but really in the wider scheme of things, it, um, it was very, uh, it was very painful, but it was also, um, very mystical because I, I, that 
was the first time I heard the reading of the Passion in a way that I could intimately see myself as a part of that crowd. And so it was, it again, I think even in those painful moments, there's always grace to be found. And it's always the Spirit saying, you're where you're supposed to be, you're where Jesus was. Um, and so, yes, but it, it really was, um, it, it stayed with me. And you know, and then and then moving forward again, we always have choices in life. It could have been like a, a, an incident of I'm never putting that on again. But instead, I said, no, I'm going to wear it out as often as I'm allowed and as often as I'm able. And so, even now as a priest, I know I never wear a chasuble. The only time I ever put a chasuble on was for my ordination. Um, in part because of my height, I'm short, and when I get too many layers on, I start feeling like a ball. So you know, I just uh, that's part of the reason. Uh, I also just don't like all the layers. Um, but I love my alb. I don't, I don't um, preside at any liturgical celebration without my alb and a stole because, you know, part of it probably was the going back to that moment that there's a, a, a you know, and the alb represents our baptismal dignity. It's the white cloth we're putting on Christ. And it's like, um, I think we really have to hold our ground and say, you know, we too are equal um, through our baptism and the dignity of Christ. And so yes, the, the alb for me after that incident became a very, very important symbol of, of dignity. Good. Well, we'll shift over to talk about Hildegard a little more. Um, obviously, as you related it, uh, she became mm -hmm. a great uh, scholarly interest for you, but there was so much more going on than that. And, and you revealed that in the book. And, you know, I came out of a Lutheran background and did not have much of a sense of the communion of saints. I did not, until I was an adult, really conceptualize how we are accompanied on our journey by these, these great men and women who have gone before us. And I loved in the book how First, you were intrigued by her, but then there became a sort of relationship, a mystical bond between you and Hildegard. And it, I would love to hear mm -hmm. more from you about that, especially for those people who are new to Catholicism and they, they don't understand how this can happen. Absolutely. So um, going back, and I think I mentioned this in, in the book, but uh, so m my dad died on Easter Sunday morning, 1979. And so, you know, having um, a, 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 a tragedy like that happen on a holy day, um, you know, it was rough for my family. You know, my grandparents struggled for the rest of my um, childhood uh, to even be around the family, especially around me and my brother on Easter, because it was just so painful. And I had a, uh, a nun, uh, an aunt who was a nun, and uh, she made the comment to me when I was younger. And she uh, said, you know, it's very special that your dad died on Easter because that means he went right to heaven. And so, you know, as a kid, that's very comforting, even if I wasn't, you know, wasn't sure exactly if I thought that's the way it worked. I, it was a very comforting uh, um, uh, comment. And and so growing up, I was always very uh, close in, to the church. Even my mom was not Catholic, but my grandparents were. And, and so I was raised in Catholic schools. And I always found comfort in the church. And I think because my dad died on Easter, um, there was something that just connected me on a on a soul level to the liturgical mm -hmm. calendar and and so i i love the liturgical calendar i love to celebrate the seasons i love to celebrate the uh the feast days of the saints um and i you know just as we celebrate the um the, the you know spring fall winter all the uh, natural earthly seasons I, I i love celebrating the liturgical seasons and i think it's a reminder you know um that those who have gone before us, whether it's my dad, whether it's St. Hildegard, whether it's Mary Magdalene, whoever, that they're still here. We don't know exactly how, you know, but but that we, we trust that they're still walking with us. They're guiding us. They're sending us messages. Um, as a priest, I hear so many stories from people, you know, how after their loved one died, you know, something happened, a, a song came on the radio or a, a bird appeared that they used to watch together or something like that that reminds them that they're still still here. And so I always found comfort in that as a child uh, with my own dad's death. You know, I looked for signs. I looked for those opportunities to say, you know, I know my dad's here with me. And so as a, a Catholic uh, who 
you know, who, who participates regularly in the, um, the different saints feast days and the communion of saints. Um, I, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big, it's not, it's never been a big leap for me to say, well, yeah, Hildegard mm -hmm. is guiding us or Julian of Norwich is right here. Or of course, Mary Magdalene is inspiring that because I, I we say the same thing about our, our loved ones. And, and, and these are essentially our loved ones who we just didn't have a chance to meet in this, in this earthly life. And so when I met Hildegard, um, you know, there are a few things about Hildegard that I struggle with. She was, uh, you know, she was a 12th century um, um, a German Benedictine. And so her theology is very, very conservative uh, by, by today's standards. Um, you know, some of it's actually quite offensive. Um, however, she also, in other ways, was very progressive. Her understanding of veriditas, or which translated from the Latin means greening power, the greening power in nature, which for Hildegard extends far beyond you know, the plants, which it's spring, I'm, I'm looking outside and the Veritas is all coming up in the Hildegard house gardens and it's beautiful. But for Hildegard, it's also spiritual and emotional. And, you know, when we read that beautiful gospel of, you know, from uh, the gospel of John, uh, the, I am the vine, you are the branches. Um, and Jesus talks about, you know, being the source of that growth and that, that you know, or the fig tree gospels, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many beautiful passages in the scriptures about plants and, and uh, drying up or being fruitful. And, and Hildegard takes that and really weaves it together with this concept of veritas. And um, and so anyway, so I, I of course fell in love with uh, her her understanding of veritas. Very holistic. She was a, you know very holistic for Hildegard. If we're suffering in any way, physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, if we're living a life of sin, for example, we're gonna we're gonna be dry in certain ways. And so. Um, you know, uh, that holistic approach attracted me to Hildegard. Even now as a priest um, and uh, somebody who celebrates the Sacrament of Reconciliation regularly with either individuals or communal, we, um, we, we use that image of Veritas rather than focusing so much on our sinfulness. We focus more on our dryness, like what parts of our life are dry and brutal and need to be renewed and refreshed. So it's just, it's a beautiful uh, sacramental image too of re restoration. Uh, so I fell in love with that, fell in love with her music. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with her music, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, she left us over 72 hymns, mostly antiphons, to the saints. Um, she had a special devotion to St. Ursula. So we have quite a few hymns to St. Mm -hmm. Ursula and Mary. Uh, she's got a beautiful um, beautiful uh, hymns to uh, Mary, who she refers to as the greenest branch, Veridissima Virga, the greenest branch. And so, um, and, her, and her music is... Uh, it's a chant. It's Latin chant. It, it's often categorized as Gregorian mm -hmm. chant, but it's really not. It's in its own category, but there's nowhere to put it. So it gets categorized with Gregorian chant. Um, so I fell in love with her music. Of course, I was intrigued by her art. Um, you know, as uh, somebody who now has spent uh, well, 14, 15 years studying Hildegard, um, I'm at a place where, you know, I, I would agree with the, um, you know, more of the mainstream scholarship that Hildegard probably did not personally produce all that art. It was probably done in her convent. Some of them may be under her direction, but others after she died. Um, and so nonetheless, it, it flows out of her, her uh, visions. And so, you know, I think we can still properly keep it in her, her, um, in her category, but at the same time, recognizing that it may have come from those who were trying to preserve her charism. But I, I was very intrigued by her art. And and um and what I really fell in love with, and I'm still it's still my favorite um, block of her work outside of her music, um, are her letters. And uh, so the 30 day journey that you mentioned at the beginning, the uh, retreat book, um, I excerpted um, exclusively from her letters for that book because uh, those that's one part of her her body of writings that doesn't I don't think get the attention that it deserves. A lot of people are not even familiar that it exists. And uh, in it, you know, she corresponded with so many people, um, not, not only clergy, abbots, pr um, uh, priests, uh, bishops, popes, um, but she uh, corresponded with, of course, abbesses and, and uh, women in leadership, but also uh, emperors. You know, we've got a body of letters from between her and the emperor Barbarossa. Um, and so uh, and, and in those letters, she's feisty. I mean, she holds her own. And, and I think I, that really spoke to me, especially as I was working through my own struggles with the institutional church, um, that Hildegard, while she remained obedient and, um, she did not write in support of women's ordination. So I had to work that piece out with my relationship with Hildegard. Um, she certainly, um, 
didn't hesitate to, to call out the uh, hierarchy when they were not acting justly or acting Christ-like or doing what they were supposed to do. And so I've always found a lot of comfort there and not just comfort, but humor. You know, if I'm having a bad day or, you know, struggling with the institution in any way, I like to read them and it makes me feel better. I think, all right, Hildegard survived it. And, you know, what I'm risking, yes, excommunication, shunning, all those things are painful, but I'm not, I'm not facing a pyre or I'm not facing a rack or I'm not facing, you know, some of that was a little more prevalent after Hildegard, but nonetheless, you know, there was a lot of, it was dangerous. And in, in, even in the 12th century, even though the uh, witch craze had you know, come into full force yet, it was still very dangerous to be condemned a heretic in that era. And so she, what she risked was much greater even than what, what I am or what any of us are as women priests. And so I find encouragement. I find, um, like I said, humor. Um, and, and so anyways, I love, I love her letters. So I fell in love with her letters. Uh, and, and I'm, a, you know, I'm a pastor. And so from a practical perspective, her letters are much more, you know, she's dealing with like St. Paul was in his letters. She's dealing with practical pastoral issues. And, and I like that. It's um, so anyway, so, um, so I just fell in love with her. And then when I also recognize that she was an herbalist, I do a lot of uh, work and presentations on Hildegard and herbs. Uh, as you know, you've been there, we have beautiful herb gardens at the Hildegard house. Um, I just I fell in love with every every piece of that. And, and that helps me then to put in context some of her theological uh, perspectives that may not be totally appropriate for us today. But when you take, you know, so if you just pull those pieces out, you know that you know that's a problem. However, if you uh, if you approach Hildegard from a holistic perspective, and she was very much about being holistic, um, she was just, in my humble opinion, one of the most amazing women in the history of the church, and I think is is in a very um, elevated place among the communion of saints. So I think she's calling some shots up there. So probably right next to Mary, you know. <laughs> The, the greenest branch, I think you got Mary and then you got Hildegard. I, I love I that. So. Yeah, I act. And I, and I, I think, I was going to say, I think she has so much to offer leadership today. I mean, she was a leader at the end of the day. So my, my PhD, so I have a doctorate of ministry from the seminary and then I have a PhD and my PhD is in, is actually in mm -hmm. ethical and creative leadership. I used Hildegard as my model. And so, um, you know, as someone who's very interested in, in leadership, which, which I am, um, I think Hildegard emerges just as a model of leadership that we can draw from today. Wonderful. Well, she did speak truth to power and she may not have been a, a woman priest, but she definitely mm -hmm. uh, was persecuted for encroaching, or at least the perception that she was encroaching on male power uh, toward the end of her life. Can you explain that a little bit, what they did to her? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, one of the stories that um, many are familiar with with Hildegard was she spent the last six months or so, I mean, give or take, um, last block of, of time in the last year of her life um, under an interdict. So an interdict is not quite as serious as an ex excommunication, but it's pretty serious. And in the Middle Ages, especially to die in a, in a state of uh, interdict meant that you would not uh, be able to receive last rites. And, you know, that was serious. Uh, uh, penalty, in the, especially in the Middle Ages, oh, you know, where there was, um, you know, just a different understanding of, of sacraments. And so oh, what happened was, uh, you know, as the uh, story goes, um, Hildegard buried uh, somebody in the monastery grounds who had been excommunicated. And, you know, up until relatively recently, uh, somebody not in uh, communion with the church could not be buried in consecrated or um, Catholic uh, grounds, either at a monastery or uh, even in, in the, and I'm sure other places, but even here in the Diocese of Cleveland, it's only been up, up relatively recently that you didn't need a letter from the parish to get be buried in a uh, in a Catholic cemetery. So, you know, we just, I mean, that's brought itself into, into our modern times, that attitude. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, because this man had been excommunicated, he, uh, you know, by church law wasn't supposed to be buried in the, um, in the consecrated ground. And so, um, but Hildegard, buried him there. And, and so when the, um, the uh, powers that be the, uh, you know, the uh, hierarchy or the bishops and minds got wind of it, um, they um, uh, demanded that she exhume the body and uh, she refused. And so she was ordered to exhume the body and she refused. 
And so she was placed under an interdict. And so what that meant was um, that the she and her higher convent, so that they did not um, receive Eucharist, they could not um, you know receive any of the sacraments, including last rites. But they also were prohibited from singing the liturgy of the hours. And for yeah. Benedictines, um, that's yeah. their whole daily prayer schedule. And and so Hildegard wrote um, a scathing letter. It's one of her most famous letters um, near the end of the collection of of her letters, a scathing letter. Um, you know. A very long letter letting the bishops know um, the consequences of silencing God's angels, which of course referred to Hildegard and uh, yeah. and her sister. Um, and you know, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically said that um, you know by doing so, they're going to lose their place among the um, the heavenly choir. So, in other words, they're going to yeah. go. They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to go to hell. Yeah. And so she um, at eight at eighty, yeah, so for silencing God's angels, but. Um, unjustly for unjustly silencing God's angels. And so um, at 80 years old, she, you know, hand delivered or personally delivered this scathing letter to the bishops to uh, to attempt to get the interdict lifted. Um, I have this image of Hildegard, whether or not it's what happened. I have this image of her almost stomping, you know, from uh, from um, Rupertsburg to Mines to, to deliver this letter. Uh, they did not immediately uh, lift the interdict. They basically said, you know, thank you. We'll talk about it. And then um, she was good friends with uh, the Archbishop in Cologne, Philip, and and so Philip came to her defense and um, attested to the fact that um, a valid priest had heard the confession and that the man had been reconciled to the church. And so um, after Philip, you know, testified for her, um, they lifted the interdict and she died shortly afterwards. Um, some of the legends say that uh, you know Hildegard sent her sisters out to disguise where the body was buried, so that the um, you know the bishops couldn't exhume the body themselves. It, and one of the things that she said in this letter was that by you know if she were to exhume the body, she would offend God, and she was more afraid of offending God than she was offending the hierarchy. Yeah. Um, you know, a backstory to that, and there's no evidence to support this. This is speculation. But up until about the 12th century, abbesses had the authority to hear confessions um, in certain places. You know, that changed. You know, of course, today women can't hear, at least not according to Rome, can't hear confessions. But um, but at that time, abbesses in some instances had the uh, faculties to do so. Hildegard was never actually named an abbess. And that's huge um, detail. Again, that's one of those things like the L, but it seems like it's minor because I know different refer to her as an abbess and she really functioned as one, but she was never received the faculties as an abbess. She was called a magistra or a teacher. And um, I say that's important because the, you know, an abbess would have had different faculties than a magistra, for example, to hear confessions possibly. And so, um, you know, one theory that's kind of discussed among some scholars is that um, it, it's likely she heard the confession in her infirmary that she embraced that power to function in, in that role of ambus and to do what needed to be done in her monastery and in her infirmary especially. And so that may have been the struggle may not have been at all over the, the person who was buried. It may have been over whether or not Hildegard had had the authority to hear. Yeah. Little little bit of, little bit little little bit of, little bit. But and, and I say that because so that, Okay. I was just gonna say there was. I was just gonna was say just there gonna was say the letter that Philip wrote. Uh, well, the letter that Philip had written to uh, to come to her defense testified to the fact that a validly um, ordained priest, or he didn't use those words, but that a priest heard the confession, and the priest heard the confession tells me just based on my research that that means there was question of did the confession or did an actual priest hear the confession. So she, like women today, so she, was like women today, these, was battling. And with so these, she was battling with these. Yeah, she definitions was battling of with what women can and cannot do. What women can as and minister, cannot do. As minister, as so minister, maybe that's one of the meeting so points. Maybe that's for one of the meeting points. For patron saint of women priests. Patron saint of women priests. <laughs> she had her forbidden graces. She too. had her forbidden graces. She was not allowed too. to partake. And she in. was not allowed to partake in. Oh, ex oh, exactly. And so, you know, again, whenever I see, you know, a, a referred to as an abbess, I mean, it, it, on one level, it doesn't bother me. On another level, it bothers me a lot because that even that one word is packed. And it really, I think it, it played a part in what happened at the end of her life. So, um, but, uh, you know, Hildegard was such a powerful figure, even in her day. There's a part of me that feels she was not named an abbess. She was named a magistra to, to 
for a little bit because, you know, I mean, here we are nine. 900 years later, and she's still a powerhouse. And so, you know, I think it was one way that they were trying to control her and, and she probably took it into her own hands to do what needed to be done, like we all are. And, um, and she suffered for it. And it's only very recently, and it's that, only she very recently saint, that she correct? was made a saint, correct? So 2012, she didn't know, uh, 79, so it took a few years. <laughs> uh, her case was put forward many times over the years, almost immediately after her death. And then, you know, it kept being rejected for different reasons. And, um, you know, she's been long revered in Germany as a saint. So she was already locally canonized, if you will. But um, she was universally canonized, you know, universally canonized by the church in 2012 by Pope Benedict the 16th. And so he named her a saint in, in uh, May of 2012, and then named her a doctor of the church in October of the same year. So, you know, um, also being named a doctor of the church that, you know, would made her the fourth mm -hmm. female doctor of the church. So, as I read your book, the as theme of book, Veritas, the theme is of just Veritas everywhere, is and I just especially where, and I felt especially that having been felt to that fair port been harbor and to fair how port harbor and now, seeing how you are living just from now. my point and of view i just from my point of view i can see how that concept just affects so many things about your life so many ministry. things about your uh, life the earth ministry. keeping that you do uh, the earth the keeping Hildegard that you do with the uh, Hildegard. your emphasis uh, on your emphasis justice on and fair trade justice, that there's a fair trade sense of the world a sense of all the world needing to be green and lively to together be green and justice. And lively would you like to say a little more about your, would you like to say a little your, more uh, about your, emphasis on fair trade your, uh, and emphasis the green on shepherd trade and store. the green shepherdess store absolutely so um my first master's degree that i uh, completed at the at st mary seminary uh the topic of my uh, uh, thesis was um, the biblical basis for catholic social teaching so uh, long before I um, got on this ordination path, I uh, have been involved with Catholic social teaching. And, and of course, out of that, you know, comes so many issues around women and, you know, the injustices uh, women uh, face, not only uh, in the church, but globally in so many ways, especially issues of human trafficking. And um, I, I became particularly interested in the topic of human trafficking and the sex industry with women. Um, my husband's from the Philippines, and uh, one of the first uh, bits of research I did as an undergrad was the issue of uh, sex trafficking of women in the Philippines. I have three three daughters, and, um, you know, so it felt a little personal that, uh, you know, my daughters are, you know, safe, if you will, because they're, they're born here and they're born into somewhat of a life of privilege, and yet, you know, their 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 family, their cousins, their our nieces. You know, they're very vulnerable in some ways, in, uh, being in another part of the world. And so, um, you know, I, I I my again, I think when we can make a personal connection to these topics, um, you know, they they touch our our hearts in a different way. And so, I I became very interested in um, in human trafficking as an undergrad, especially like I said, the topic of women in the sex industry, and particularly in Philippines and Asia and, and places where it's just rampant. And um, from there, I uh, um, just started getting in, interested in all other kinds of topics, immigration. I live in an area of Ohio where we have a lot of uh, agricultural work. So we have a, a large um, uh, Im uh, immigrant or migrant population in Mexico, you know, many of them undocumented and not treated very well, you know, working out in the fields and things like that. And, uh, and so that just sort of, um, you know, just became a part of my ministry at the parish. And so uh, for the 22 years I worked at St. Anthony's, um, every um, Lent, um, spring and then winter, fall for Christmas, I would host um, a fair meal in the foyer of the church or the school hallway where we would sell chocolate or coffee, you know, the normal uh, church fair trade um, um, sales. And, and I really always appreciated that opportunity to let the community know that, you know, the, the foods that we consume, the coffee we drink, whatever it might be that, somebody produced that, you know, we lose sight of that when we're just going up and down the grocery store aisles because we're, the relationships aren't visible, whether they're healthy or toxic, the relationships aren't as visible. And, and so it was always an opportunity to, to raise some awareness, if, if nothing else, to, to raise that awareness. When I um, made the very painful decision to leave my position at St. Anthony's in 18, that was probably the hardest hardest decision I've ever had to make. It was, you know, I mean, there were other, I've had other painful moments in my life, but mostly those are thrust upon us. But but to make that decision was very painful. 
and um, sitting with this idea of, all right, I'm going to, you know, follow my, my call to ordain ministry, but I don't even know if I'm ever going to be paid as a pastor. I don't know if I'm going to be in a position where I can earn a salary as an independent um, Catholic pre woman priest. Um, my husband and I had a conversation about what I would do for, for employment. And, um, you know, so there was a question of me getting a job, of course, but then that would take me out of Fairport Harbor. You know, the Hildegard house is in Fairport Harbor. We live next door to it. And I, and I've been so engaged in Fairport Harbor for so long. I love, you know, I love it here. Uh, and so we decided to take a risk and open up a small little fair trade store in Fairport Harbor. And at least then be able to, I could continue to live out that piece of my ministry in a different way. Um, and also raise awareness here. I love the fact that the word fair is in Fairport Harbor. I thought, you know, there's all these signs. I'm always looking for signs to affirm my decisions. Um, and I really didn't expect the church to take off as it did on the Hildegard house. Um, and so as it turns out, both the church and the store have grown very quickly and it's wonderful, but, uh, you know, neither was quite expected. And so, uh, last year, last June, we were able to uh, to move our, our store location from the, the storefront that was in, which was a little bit off the beaten path and, um, you know, and, and very small, uh, onto a, a new storefront that's right in the main business district, right by the lighthouse and the beach, and and really to expand our, our presence, not only in the village, but online and other places. And then uh, recently, um, I was elected to the Fairport or the uh, Fair Trade Federation Board of Directors, and um, that's a national board. and. For me, it almost felt like a culmination of all my work I've done since an undergrad to now in terms of uh, social justice. Um, and it's, you know, the social justice issues, as you know, are just, they're overwhelming. There's just so many issues. And one of the things I learned along the way, I've had some great professors, both at the seminary and as, as an undergrad at Cleveland State University, who used to always say, you know, you're gonna have to pick, a, like, not just to me personally, but to everybody, you know, pick an area and hone in on that. Because if you try to do it all, you're gonna be overwhelmed and you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to do anything. And so for me, you know, just to address the topics of immigration, human trafficking, all of those things, I think culminate to some degree in fair trade because the products we are touched by all of those issues. And so if we can make sure that you know, that, that we're buying is not being picked by children or slaves or undocumented migrants or that the, uh, you know, the, the clothing that we're buying is not being made in a sweatshop in Bangladesh where, you know, they have no, they're not a making enough money, the workers at the end of the day to even feed their families, but that the, you know, the, the, the factory is unsafe and could collapse at any minute that it's hot, they're not getting uh, breaks, you know, all of those things. Um, and also to pre uh, create an app outlet for the artisans and the uh say, you know, who are sound. not they really are not you know, we we sometimes see them as charity cases they're not they're very talented artisans that don't have outlets for their work and then what happens is they're in a part of the world where there's no market there's no outlet and then they become very vulnerable to things like trafficking um because they have no other way to support their families and so uh, it's just the way that I found a niche to stay connected to all, of, like a whole lot or a whole pile of these issues, um, but to gain so that I didn't get overwhelmed. And I'm not, I'm not, um, I mean, I'm very involved. I mean, my heart's involved with advocacy, but my ministry is not. I'm a writer, I'm a preacher, and I'm a store owner. And so I find ways to support it through those those platforms. And the, the Green Shepherd is in uh, really, I think a positive uh, force here in Fairport Harbor. Um, so many people come in and want to talk about fair trade. They want to talk about human trafficking. They want to talk about these issues, mm -hmm. and um, and the products are just beautiful. Oh, yes. And and then oh, you know everybody so leaves excited. And so many people come in and say there's a vibe mm -hmm. in here. And I I tell them mm -hmm. the vibe is that you're feeling the positive energy yeah. of the workers and the farmers who are able to go home at the end of the day and actually feed their families. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how I got involved with with that, and so it's wonderful. Uh, you know, there are days that I'm spread a little thin between the two places, mm -hmm. but um, I see the the Green Shepherd is just an extension of my ministry in other contexts. Yeah, I love your in store. More of a secular kind. <laughs> I I absolutely love your store, you. and Thank I you. I also would uh, love it if you people can shop there online. Correct. 
correct. And we just switched over to a new online platform, which is super user friendly. It's beautiful. Um, you know, and I, I could, um, it, you know, the address is just www.thegreenshepherdist.com. Um, and yes, we, you can shop online. We ship anywhere in the U.S. Um, right now, we don't have it set up to ship out of the U.S. But if somebody really wanted something, I could work with them on that and, and just invoice the shipping on it. But I, I know I can't stay away. I, I always look and I go, I'll just wait. I, I'm going to get that, but I have to just wait. <laughs> but beautiful, beautiful merchandise. And the heart of it, as you said, is that that people need this outlet for their hard work so that they can live. And And the fact that there are these fair trade organizations and people like you who are helping us do that background checking because it's impossible for the average person to know what we're buying. So we really appreciate that. So also another uh, web address that I would appreciate you sharing is for your faith community. If you would like to, um, it is possible for people to join you on zoom mm -hmm. for worship. And it's really a lovely and unique community. I find the, for me, the liturgies are a beautiful blend of the, what I would expect from a traditional Roman mass, but also such creativity and inclusive language. It's just beautiful. So if you could share that also. Absolutely. And that and we've tried to do that. We've tried to preserve the integrity of the liturgy, but of course we're using a much um, more inclusive language. We tried to tone down the atonement theology, make it a bit healthier. And, um, but we also want it to feel like you went you went to mass. So we, we're trying to find that balance. But the web address is www.hildegardhaus, H-A-U-S, the German spelling, um, dot org. Um, if, you, if you type in uh, the English spelling, you will get a wonderful uh, place in Kentucky, a, a hospice um, center, the Hildegard House there. So if you end up in Kentucky, you're, you just have to do the German spelling, H-A-U-S, and you'll find us. That's that's terrific. And I uh, there's so much in this book and I will I will provide I don't know if this will come up backwards on the on the final video, but I will provide a video uh, or an image of the book cover. I encourage you to read it. There's we we barely scratched the surface of the book in this discussion. There's so much richness there. We didn't even get into your travels to Germany and your actually being in those places and your ordination. So mm -hmm. I encourage people to buy the book and read it. And also I'm now intrigued about the 30 days with Hildegard because that sounds like a spiritual retreat I could use. Oh, so, <laughs> thank you. Did you have anything else you would like to add to wrap us up here? Uh, anything that I left out or? I appreciate uh, you taking the, the time to, uh, to, to have this conversation. And um, I, you know, I, I guess if I have any, um, anything I want to share is that, uh, you know, in so many ways, and, and I, and I would imagine I speak for many of the women priests in this regard, you know, the last five years or so, um, since I made that decision and then followed my call have been hard, you know, there's no sugar coating it. This is not an easy journey. And, um, you know, I would be lying if I didn't say there were times I thought, did I make a mistake? Why did I do this? I had, you know, I had a pension where I was at, you know, you have all those, um, moments. Um, but the grace, you know, but I'll just conclude with the title of the book, the grace that I've experienced and the freedom and the uh, the ability to really serve people of God without worrying about if I'm breaking any rules. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, one of the, if any images of Christ comes out of the scriptures for me, that's dominant. It's that whenever Jesus is told, you can't do that, it's the Sabbath, or you can't do that, Jesus turns right around and says, give me your hand. You know what's ailing you i'm coming to your house and he, he always put the law of love over the law if you will and so i um you know on those days where i'm feeling um not discouraged but tired you know i mean it's like you said we're, we're, we're traveling uphill here as women priests um remember i remind myself that so many of the people i minister to and so many of the people that come to me for pastoral care um, have been so deeply wounded by the institution because the law, whatever that would be in their case, didn't allow them to receive the care and the, and the, and the uh, assistance that they needed. And so in, in for, for that, that's where that whole thing of forbidden grace comes in because, it, you know, what I've experienced and I think the 
women race movement in general is experienced as grace. And it, you know, but according to the institution that we all come out of, it, it's forbidden. You know, we're forbidden to anoint, we're forbidden to hear confession, we're forbidden to break bread. And that's what the people so desperately need. And, and those are every story that comes out of, of the scriptures of, you know, of, of, uh, of Jesus caring for others. And so, so I guess I would just leave it with that, that, you know, anyone who is uh, either already involved in this movement is, is discerning it um, and or just supporting it. You know, there's risk and there's price a cost involved for all of us. At the same time, the, the grace that we receive our surpasses that. So I, I guess I would just just leave it with that, that, you know, trust in that grace. And, you know, uh, St. Hildegard has a, a famous uh, statement, uh, you know, so she's often depicted with feathers in her, in her letters. Um, she's got the story mm -hmm. where, you know, she talks about a feather doesn't move about because of anything of its own accord, but because the air bears the walk. Or, you know, or blows, you know, board. So for us, we are feathers on the breath of God. And when we surrender ourselves to that, um, you know, yes, sometimes the feathers bump into walls and sometimes they come into a mud puddle, but they get back up again and can continue on. And so the, the, the grace, again, far surpasses the struggle. That is a beautiful image and a beautiful inspiration to end on. So I thank you so much, Shannon. Reverend Shannon, I want to I want to honor you as that because to me you are an inspiration as a woman priest. Uh, thank you so very much for being with us today, and thank you all all of you for joining us. I hope you've been as inspired by Reverend Shannon as I have been. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Catholic is sustained by the grace of God and the communion of saints. Say your prayers, kids, and until next time, give heartfelt thanks to God.